So from the word of God, we'll start in 2 Corinthians 13. We'll just read a few verses from there, and then we'll turn to Matthew chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says in chapter 13, This is the third time I am coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warned those who sinned before and all the others, and I warn them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in you, he is not weak in dealing with you, but he's powerful amongst among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. We also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourself? That Jesus Christ is in you. Yes, indeed, you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that we may not do wrong, that we may appear to have met the test, but that you do sorry, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we can do nothing, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason, I write these things while I'm away from you. When I come, I may not have to be severe in the use of my of the authority that the Lord has given me, given me for building, not for tearing down. See, he's not like that minister, the first minister who gave RC no hope, took away any hope he had. He says, "How I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, nor you as it were." That we are glad when you are uh, strong, but we are weak. And then let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter 4. And this is after Jesus has experienced the temptation of the devil in the wilderness. And in verse 12, uh, we read, When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So, it was, so that was what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, uh, might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishing. He said to them, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick. Those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those possessed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those 
who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And we'll leave the reading of the word of God there. Having just read from chapter four, we didn't read the start of it, but uh, thinking of chapter four, if you said to someone, tell me the way through Matthew, what, what takes place in the different chapters of Matthew's gospel, and you came to chapter four, uh, then well, there's a, a great mountain there, isn't there? That great mountain of truth. Uh, it, uh, temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one of the great mountain places of scripture. Jesus going into the wilderness and being tempted those 40 days. And what about the rest? What happens next? What happens next in Matthew chapter 4? And uh, many Christians might struggle to say exactly what happens next, apart from to say, well, Jesus, I believe, goes back to Galilee and begins his ministry. But then, ah, then you've got an even greater mountain happening. A real one, actually. A sermon on a mountainside. We read the opening part of it. And so you've got these two giant mountains of truth, as it were, the temptation to the Lord Jesus Christ and the actual mountain that he was on when he taught what is known famously as that sermon on the mountains. Between which, between which, well, the rest is, is dwarfed. And it's easy to miss the point of what is in that bit that's dwarfed. It's easy to miss the Lord Jesus Christ pointing out the path of how you become a Christian. Repentance. That was his first word, wasn't it? From that time on in verse 17, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then follow me. He sees Peter and Andrew. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Repentance to God. Follow me. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you follow him. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the point that is made here is the pathway to become a Christian is repentance to God. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we were saying this morning, you know, it's a new year. It's a good time to evaluate things. People all over the world don't do that, don't they? New year. And how important it is, if we call ourselves Christians, how important it is for us to have a, a kind of a spiritual check. That we, at this time, as it we look at the truth and we don't neglect these things and we look to, as we read in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians there, to examine ourselves, to see whether we are in the faith. There are many who come to an element of the truth and then kind of neglect and don't go any further with it, as it were, but examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. There is a, a poverty of the word of God in churches today. And I've met, and I'm sure you've probably met, people who've called themselves Christians, but they, they know little of the truth. I coined it many years ago, and I don't know if it's my phrase or if I picked it up from someone. I don't think I've heard it from anyone else, but salvation is the bit part. There's other more important things, and we just got to get you saved, and then we can start to deal with the bigger issues and so forth. Salvation is the bit part. Uh, the path, though to Christianity, where salvation is a bit part. The path is uneven and is covered in weeds. And it's hard when truth is neglected to really be able to see and understand what the path actually is, how it is you come to Christ. And I said this morning that uh, we come face to face here with two sheer mountains. And the one we looked at this morning was the mountain of easy believism, from which it's easy to fall into a pit where you're called a Christian when you're not. Say this prayer. Done. Now you are saved. Beware. This morning, the, 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 really the, the message title was Beware False Repentance. Beware of false repentance. And we looked at some of the kind of signs of that, that or where people might think they've got true repentance, but actually it's false repentance. Our concern tonight is to lay that to one side. And our concern tonight is 
the other mountain, which we might call hard believism, which I think this man who, uh, the minister, the first one he spoke to, was someone who set up a mountain, as, as, uh, you know, put that mountain before this poor man here, and said, what you've experienced is not the nature of true religion. You must seek a better hope, or you'll not be admitted to heaven. Gave him no other outlet, no other possibility. It's hard believism. Hard believism. Hard believism is a sheer mountain that you look up, it's, it seems almost impossible to climb. You're left looking longingly upwards. Can I ever be a Christian? And I want us to look tonight at true repentance, true repentance, and hope and pray that it will be a source of encouragement for every one of us. Because we don't want to be left how we were this morning, in a sense, with everything being false. You see, here, when the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we have, I've got a red letter Bible in front of me here, and so the first two things that Jesus says when he returns to Galilee, repent, follow me. It's easy for me to see it in my Bible. It's there in verse 17, there in verse 19 in yours. Repent, follow me. Having set forth the, the pathway to the kingdom, repentance and faith, Jesus shows as you come to this great sermon in chapter five, he shows true repentance true repentance and what it produces in the heart of the one who's truly penitent as it were he shows it in these what's called the beatitudes we didn't read all of them but they're evident in all of them what it is to experience true repentance and the result of them what true repentance produces we can say that true repentance part is filled as you look through these beatitudes, it's filled with understanding, sorrow, humiliation, longing, also change, change. It's a consequence of that. No, though not uh, directly, we might say in there, but it is in there because bless is in each of those beatitudes. Blessed are you, happy are you, rejoicing on you. Overjoyed on. And so it doesn't leave you in sorrow, doesn't leave you in uh, humiliation. Oh, yes, it's humbling. And it's humbling life as a Christian we live, but not one of uh, where we're perpetually in sorrow and depressed and downcast. It also brings change. Change. Now, it's not the focus for us directly tonight to consider that second part of that two-sided coin, repentance and faith. They go together, don't they? They're inseparable. But what is evident in these Beatitudes, perhaps we should have read the rest of them, really. I didn't do so for, for time's sake. But what is evident in these, in these Beatitudes is that the first part of each one, take verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Take verse four. Blessed are those who mourn. What is evident in the first part of each one is that faith in Christ brings the reward that's revealed in the second part. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Why? Or the outcome, rather. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. The outcome. For they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Going on, the merciful will receive mercy. The pure in heart will see God. Peacemakers will be called sons of God. You see, the first part, what's evident in a heart of someone, if it's evident, if that's evident in you in the first part there, then you can be sure that faith in Christ brings the reward that's revealed in the second part. So let's search our hearts. Search our hearts. As Paul says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. And let me say this. If in these Beatitudes, if the first part of each of the Beatitudes is true of me, is true of you, 
if the first part of each of these Beatitudes is true of us, then we can have absolute confidence and certainty that the second part, without doubt, belongs to us also. If the first part's true, the second part is true. So let's consider, first of all, the, the, the first part, as it were, uh, or the first of these, the, the signs, the signs of true repentance. And I'm going to give you six signs of true repentance, four in the first part and two in the second part in terms of truth, in, in terms of fruit. And the first of these is the sight of sin. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a person who spends freely money they haven't got, freely just heedless of what they're doing, chucking money around, taking credit out and so forth, heedless of these things until suddenly, in big red letters, there it is before them, and they see it. It's clear. Thank God, with a cry, with a gasp. I'm bankrupt. I'm bankrupt. What a fool I've been. I'm bankrupt. That's how it is with sin. I worked many years ago when I was still at school. I worked in a hotel. And it was amazing. It's the first time I really came across this in my life. I've come across it many times since. And I dare say I probably over time got drawn into the same, saying the same self things as these other people, but I would hear people in this hotel when I was like a young boy, uh, there'd be talk of hell, with quite bad language as you can imagine, but there'd be talk of hell and people would be saying, well, that's where I'm going, that's where I'm going, without any seeming to be concerned about it, actually quite joyful that that's where they were going, is it? Which showed that they didn't really take the whole matter seriously. But that's how people go, that's what I'm going. Couldn't care less. I disregard. I was one of those religious nutters, you know, coming to Bible bashing and over here that nonsense. I'm not interested in those things until, until a person comes face to face with their sin and they actually see or begin to see the reality of the sin that is in them, that is in their heart. And that will lead, well, inevitably, to a confrontation with the law. And many in the process of beginning to see that will try to justify themselves and do all manner of things, as it were, but ultimately you'll arrive at the conclusion. I'm a sinner. I've got to answer for my sin. And I can't. I've got rags. I've got no spiritual riches. I'm bankrupt. I'm bankrupt before God. I can't pay the debt of my sin. I have nothing to put it right. I have nothing. The sight of sin. Sight of sin. There's no true repentance without a sight of sin. And if there's no true repentance, the path of salvation? Well, look at it. There's no evidence of your footprints on it. And then sorrow for sin. Sorrow for sin. In verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, I'm putting this all as an, this is not an exposition of the Beatitudes here, because we've got to take that word blessed, we've got to start with that. It's a wonderful word. I'm not doing that. And then not going and looking and saying, look, this is the kingdom of heaven. Look, they should be comforting. I'm just trying to, to show these certain signs of true repentance. There is a sight of sin, the poor in spirit. But actually, if you've had a sight of sin, I can say with a confidence because the word of God is it. You're blessed. Blessed if you've had a sight of sin. Blessed if you see your poverty in spirit. You know, many people know, oh, I'm not good enough. Or I'm good this or the other. I don't worry about these things. I'm not concerned about dying. I'm tough. I'm me. I'm this, that, and the other. But when you come to the end of yourself, Realize your poverty of spirit. That's a sight of sin that does that. But then you have next the sorrow for sin. 
Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn. Here's a quote that I've kind of adjusted from Thomas Watson, the Puritan. The true martyrs who've shed their blood for Christ are those who first shed tears for their sin. True martyrs who've shed their blood for Christ are those who first shed tears for their sin. The sight of sin, realizing your poverty of spirit, the sight of sin is a bitter pill. Sorrow for sin. It's a bitter pill, but I tell you, sorrow for sin will make Christ all the more precious. Sorrow for sin will help drive out sin, will help the true penitent, the true repentant one, will help them in their battle against that old man who likes to raise his head up as it were. And sorrow for sin, ah, oh, will make the comfort for the saints all the more solid, solid joys and lasting treasures. None but Zion's children know, and they know it because they've been down the pathway. They've seen sin in their heart. They've mourned for sin in their heart, sorrow for sin. But you see, let bring it in. They shall be comforted. There's the comfort. Sorrow for sin leads to joy in Christ. And the one who's truly sorry for sin it is not taken with the consequences. Oh no, I'm going to have to stand before the Lord. Like someone I was talking about this morning who's uh, committed a crime and, uh, and is trying to uh, get a lighter sentence and so forth. They're not taken with the consequences. They're not trying to get off of a lighter sentence. They're not sorry because of the consequences. They're not taken up with them. But their concern is that they've broken God's laws. And that brings sorrow to them. This poor man here, you can see that through and through. He was sorry he broke God's laws. Sorry. Oh, the man was weeping because of his sin. Poorly counseled by that first minister. No one to guide him or anything like that. Poor man was floundering around like a fish out of water. Didn't know where he was. David, in Psalm 51, he doesn't say, oh, I'm going to face terrible consequences because of what I've done with Bathsheba. He says, I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. He sees his sin. He's mourning. His sorrow for his sin is not because of the consequences. He's like Joseph. But turn it on its head. Supposing Joseph hadn't fled from Potiphar's wife. How is it I could do such a thing? How is it I could sin against God? But Joseph doesn't, does he? He says, I'm not going to do such a thing. I'm not going to sin against God. And he flees from the presence of the woman who would lure him and trap him as he Sorrow for sin doesn't speak of the punishment. It speaks rather of the offense to God. How could we sin against God? There's no true repentance without sorrow for sin. And if there's no true repentance, then the path of salvation has got no evidence of your footprints on it. As a writer said, sin must be wept over before it can be confessed. Actually, a writer didn't say that. I said that. <laughs> it's one of my notes, and I missed it on the first one. Sin must first be seen before it can be wept over. That's the first one. But sin must be wept over before it can be confessed. And that's where we go now. Thirdly, confession of sin. 
And we might look and, and say, well, verses three to five all cover this uh, confession of sin. And let's take the, the third, the verse five there. Blessed are the meek, the meek. Because to be meek is to be humbled. And yes, we look at that. If we were studying the Beatitudes, we might look at that as how we treat our fellow man. But we're coming at this from the point of view of repentance. And someone truly penitent coming to the Lord. And such a one comes in that state of humility. Humbles himself before the Lord. And meekness, one of its qualities is humbleness. A humbleness of heart. I recognize my poverty of spirit. I see that. Oh, I see my sin and I are. Oh, I'm sorry for my sin because I've offended an almighty God. And I humble myself before you. And Lord, I confess my sins. Humble. Weighed down with the heavy burden. Psalm writer says, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me. Too heavy for me. What are you going to do if your sins are too heavy for you? Oh, you're going to cry out. That's confession. Crying out to God. It used to confuse me when you saw a court case and there's someone and they've been accused of a particular crime and you're maybe reading about it in a, on a newspaper or something, and you suddenly read that they, or you hear that they asked for 30 other crimes to be taken into consideration. You read it again, and you say, why are they doing that? The police didn't know they'd done it. Why are they doing that? Why is that? Surely they're, surely they're going to make the sentence worse, aren't they, by doing that? But in a false way, as we were considering this morning, it's through talking with the uh, defence counsel. They've said, look, you know, have you done anything else? Because if you have, it might be a good go with well for you. If you kind of confess some of the things, it will show that you're contrary, it will show that you're repentant. Of course, we were considering this morning, it's in a false way, but let's consider it now in a positive way. Asking for all these other offences to be taken into consideration. There's a Christian on their knees before the Lord, crying out to him, confessing their sin to the one who sees it all. And I don't now, Lord, want to hide anything from you. You know it anyway, but Lord, I want to bring this before you and I want to bring that forth before you. And I ask, oh Lord, that you would search my heart. Search me for you know me. Search my heart and reveal these things to me so I can confess it because I want to get it off of me. I don't want to be like that pilgrim Christian, as he was called, uh, who had that burden on his back. You know, I don't want any burden left. I want it all to go. I want to confess it all. And true confession not only tells of what it's done, but actually accuses itself and sentences itself. You might say something like this, so to call on the angels who were watching over. They've watched over some of your life. They've seen some of these things. Lord, I can bring angels before you can bring angels before. And I call out to the angels, you know these things that I've done. Not that they can do anything for me now, but I want everyone to know this in heaven, that I'm a sinner, that I'm a wretched man. I'm not fit to live. I deserve your judgment. It's not making excuses. The true confessor doesn't want to make excuses with a resolve, as it were, that somehow, or a hope that somehow everything will be all right. Bring it all before the Lord. But then you see, in bringing it to the Lord, there's this resolve, this heart that says, Lord, help me. I don't want to repeat these things. I don't want to do that. There's no true repentance without confession of sin. And if there's no true repentance in the path of salvation, there's no evidence of your footprints. What about shame for sin? Shame for sin. That would be number four. Sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin. Let's go back to verse four. Those who mourn, those who mourn, sight of sin brings Sorrow for sin leads to confession of sin. In confession of sin, there's a shame, a measure of shame. Oh, Lord, what a wretched person I am. You know, I don't know if you've heard dramatic testimonies. 
dramatic testimony. Now, there are some incredible testimonies for sure, but there are some who seem to have these dramatic testimonies and they like to glamorize sin. I remember hearing one man giving his testimony, he'd been involved in gangs and all sorts, and he spoke of how he actually decked this minister. And even when he was telling him, he seemed to think it had been a fun thing, a good thing. Oh, you should have seen how he fell. And he's smiling when he's saying it. This is someone who's telling his testimony. He's talking of his old life, but he's still smiling and laughing. He's glamorizing his sin. That's not shame for sin, is it? Shame for sin wants to hide that away. Yeah, we've had recently, and there's a debate, isn't there, amongst the military-minded people that you don't start telling people of the people you've killed. Not a true soldier doesn't do those things. They're quiet about it. Old Stan, you know, he was fought in World War II. He never told us half of what he went through. And yet you have someone who's you know, spouting off about these things and so forth. And I don't want to get into all of that, but just to say here that the true penitent, the one who's truly is ashamed of what they've done. Paul, who was the chief of sinners, as we saw this morning, Paul, the chief of sinners, shame for sin. He considered, didn't he, when he was now a believer, walking with the Lord and an apostle, and the greatest of apostles. He said, all my best deeds, all the things I did before, before I came to Christ, you know, they're just filthy rags, filthy rags. It's ashamed of them, ashamed of them. Ashamed of what he was, ashamed of what he did. Uh, but someone who's maybe experienced uh, what we might say a dramatic conversion and dramatic things, and we're involved in dramatic sins, crimes that we might say we put you in prison today. Oh, they'll maybe give that out in their testimony, but only to highlight their own failings, only to highlight. Look, this is the fall that I was. And to try to warn others and to show others, look, the emptiness of that way of life. Oh, I was a life of crime and I had all the women, I had all the fast cars. But I tell you what, even before I was born, I was empty. I was empty. How many times have you heard that kind of testimony? I'm only telling you. Because I want you to see that pathway. Forget the crime now, if you could have it through riches and things. It's emptiness. True repentance seeks in shaming itself, shaming oneself, ultimately, to show God's grace, and even more ultimately, to bring glory to God. There's no true repentance without shame for sin. And without shame for sin, only true, the, the repentance, well, the path of salvation? Is there any evidence that the person's put grits on? That's signs of repentance as a first part. Signs of repentance. And that's not taken, I'll probably confuse you or confuse me by saying the first and second part of each beatitude. And you might be thinking I'm now looking at the other side of the, uh, the bottom part of the verse of the beatitude. But now we're looking at the fruits. The fruits. The fruit of repentance. And in verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. There's a change that's come over the person who's truly repentant. And what? There's a desire for the things of God. There's a desire for righteousness. There's a desire for holiness. But there's also a hatred for sin. Hatred for what I once was. Now that can be placed there in the first part. It's one of the signs, isn't it, of uh, repentance, a hatred of sin. As with all of these, they can, they're interchangeable, as it were. They're all there at the beginning, but we're thinking of fruit. They grow as the Christian life advances. But this one, and it's one I want to take up, leaving aside the, uh, the righteousness at this moment, which we might call a turning from sin, will come to them. This idea of hating sin, you know, I probably wrestled with this as much as anything in the Christian life. Because when it comes to things that we might call vulgar things, vulgar sins, it's easy to hate those. 
like one hates dirt and filth and so forth. It's easy to hate things that are displeasing to us, let's say. But what about the sins that you delight in? What about those sins? You hate them. Hate them with a venom. Oh, wrestle with them. Wrestle with them. You see, if I go down that path and I listen to this first minister, the fact that I've wrestled with that and struggled with that and fallen at that time and again, well, that means that I'm, in that case, there's no nature that's, uh, it's not the nature of true religion. I must seek a better hope. Well, I'm not being admitted to heaven. How about you? How about those things that you've delighted in that are sinful? How easy have you find, found it to lay them down? How easy have you found it to bury them and not dig them up again? How easy is it you found it to not even say goodbye, but just to turn your back on them? And never go back to them. I was helped, and I've given this before, but I'll give it again, by an illustration someone gave in a sermon one time on this, by saying, simply, I love, but not as I once did. I crave, but not as I once did. And the expansion of that is just simply this. It's to say that there are things that besetting sins, as that man calls them. There are things that are... are Peculiar for each one of us, the areas that we struggle in, besetting sins, if you want to, indwelling sin, whatever name you want to put on. But if you look, if what we're looking at in terms of these signs of sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, what about hate? I can't find it in my heart to really hate them if I'm honest. Yes, but you don't love them as you once did. No, there's a truth there, isn't there? You look and you see, you haven't got the same love. And you can't play with them, as it were, as you once could. You can get no fun out of it. It leaves you cold. It leaves you feeling, uh, well, miserable and uh, destitute, as it were. And you want to get it out of your system. You want to repent of it. And you don't want to do it. Whatever it might be. It's evidence of growing in sanctification, isn't it? Have you ever sung with a passion? Calpus, I hate the sins that made thee mourn and drove thee from my breast. Have you not looked to that? We're going to sing that at the end. But have you not looked to that and almost oh, wept over it because I hate these things. I hate them. I still cling to them as it were. But then thinking, well, I've sung it with a passion, but then I've gone back to them. I don't want to this. According to that minister, we've had it, if that's the case with us. But consider it this way. Consider the love of God. Do you feel love for God right now in your heart? Could you jump up and down and say, with real feeling? And real meaning, I love you, Lord. I love you, you're the most wonderful being. Oh, you're mine, and I love you, I delight in you. You know, we, we don't always feel love, do we? Not now necessarily talking about the Lord, but for those we do love, those in our lives, those who are nearest and dearest to us. We don't look at them all the time and feel love for them all the time, is it? Nor do we do so with pain. It's the same thing, isn't it? Just the other side of a coin, isn't it? What I'm applying to love, now apply to those sins that you wrestle and struggle with when it comes to hate. There are times, if you look, you'll see there are times where you really oh, resented those things and, and wanted them gone and could sing with a passion with power. I hate those sins. But then you fall because you go back to them because you don't feel that same degree of passion. That's the spiritual warfare, my friend. That's the battle we're in. That's where you've got to wrestle. That's where you've got to fight. It's easy when the, um, the arms are up, as it were, when you're chomping at the bit for a fight. I was in the other room there, and uh, I heard a, a noise, as it were, and it was all completely pitch black, and we just come in the building, and what did I do? I did what Spurgeon did. Well, I wanted to tell you that story. You know, it's too long, but I, I threw myself at the door and booted the door, like, ah, you know, just in case there was someone there, because I knew they needed button. Because <laughs> if you wonder what was happening. <laughs> but then another time, I'm going to be timid because it catches me by surprise and I'm going to run the other way. 
And that's how it is with these things, isn't it? That's how it is with sin. You know, when we're ready for the fight, oh, we can feel we can stand tall as it were. But of course, we're never so weak as when we think we're strong. We just got to throw ourselves on the wall. Coming back to this, we don't always feel love nor hate, but we act on the principle of love. And we try to show love to those whom we love. And we try to please those whom we love. In a similar way. In a similar way. Do we not act on those principles when it comes to sin? And fight as it were. I can say again, there's no true repentance without hatred of sin. And if there's no repentance, the path of salvation, there's no evidence of that person's footprints on them. And then six, about turning from sin, because here we come again uh, in, uh, in, in verse six there, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That's a great promise, but we're thinking of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What are you doing if you're hungry and thirsting for sin? You're running in the way of sin. But if you're hungry and thirsting for righteousness, you've turned from that and you're turning a different way on. And so the sixth thing would be turning from sin. The sixth evidence, let's say, of repentance is turning from sin. The Lord's ways are the ways for you, not the paths of sin. You're a foreigner to those. Peter says, speaks of your former associates, as it were, when you were in your sins, when you were in the world. And he says how they're surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. They accuse you, they mock you, they distance themselves from you. And you say, well, good witness if that's what you're doing. But you're a foreigner to those ways now. And you love the Lord's ways more. Turning from sin. One who's turned from sin says, I've turned from sin because I've turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hunger and I thirst for him. There's much more that needs to be said, particularly on this last one here, but I'm out of time. And let me just say this. It's Thomas Watson who's given me the lead, as it were, the help in these headings, because for him, in his book on repentance, he says, here are six ingredients Six ingredients of true repentance, sight of sin, sorrow for sin, confession of sin, shame for sin, hate of sin, and turning from sin. All I'm doing is trying to show you how you can see those in these Beatitudes here, where the Lord Jesus Christ has before laid out the pathway to salvation, repentance and faith. What is repentance? Here it is in those opening verses in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Thomas Watson, he gives those six ingredients and he says, anyone who admits any, uh, 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 omits, not admits, <laughs> omits any one of them. If you cross out any one of them, you say, well, no, that's never happened. or I'm not interested in that. If you omit any one of them. Then they all lose their virtue. You have to see what sin is to be sorry for you. And so on. But here's the question. How clear must the sight of sin be? How deep must be the sorrow for sin? How passionate must be the confession of sin? I got quite passionate when I was on that heading. I can recall it now. How low must you feel the shame for sin? And how strong must be your hate of sin? And how full, how complete, how absolute must be that turn from sin to righteousness in Christ. You see, that sheer mountain of easy beliefs sets the bar too low, too low. Anything goes, anything goes. Calls himself a Christian, we're not to judge, we're not to judge. 
misunderstanding, misinterpreting scripture in doing that, by the way, that sets the bar too low. That's easy believism, but hard believism sets it too high, too high. Remember, as you examine yourselves, a false Christian has no concern about these things. A false Christian would have switched off from this a long time ago by saying, I don't need any of this. I know where I'm going. I'm completely safe. I don't need to just to examine my heart. Thank you very much. Scripture might say that, but that's for a, a wild church that needs sorting out. That's not me. I'm good. I'm solid. I'm safe. You wouldn't say that. No one here, no one on the internet who would say that. False Christian is never concerned can, uh, regarding their standing before the Lord. But you and I, are we not? Are we not? That's not to say we walk around uh, like a, someone with one of those daisy things or whatever it is, you know, I'm saved, I'm not, I'm saved, I'm not. I mean, it's not like that. But it's the concern because we want more than anything to be the Lord's and be his forever. And we have this dilemma. If we didn't sin, it wouldn't be a problem. I wouldn't be saying all this. But because we have this ongoing battle with sin, it brings doubts and the devil comes with these doubts. He's assailing us. Brings doubts and problems. Am I really saved? Can, can this be the evidence of me being a Christian? If I said that to so-and-so. Oh. The first part is the first part of these beatitudes is true of me then i can have absolute confidence and certainty that the second part without doubt belongs to me also therefore don't listen to the voice of the devil examine yourself if you pass the test how high how low we're all different aren't we we're all different there's some and they cry very easy. They're sorry of things they've done before the Lord, and tears come easily to them. The other people, I'm one of them, and it's very hard to, to get me to that point. It's not saying the Lord can't do that, He can do anything. But does that mean that because that one had 25 tears in a minute, and I only had two, that they're more likely to be saved? Of course not. Of course not. It's not right to set the bar so high. The need for Conviction of sin, which isn't one of our headings, but it's in there, of course. That need for conviction of sin is only to show us, to bring us to that point where we say, I need a saving. And if that conviction is strong and heavy in, a, uh, in someone, that's all well and good. But if it isn't, but they've come to the Savior because they've seen their need, hallelujah, hallelujah, welcome to the kingdom. Praise God. If you pass the test, He's taken your sin. He's suffered and he's died. Worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God through the Holy Spirit. You are a Christian. I'm going to leave it there, but I want to come back to this. And I want to really go into this whole subject of uh, Christian assurance. But I wanted to deal with that pathway of repentance first. And just to make it clear. what. Well, Repentance isn't and what repentance is. What are those ingredients? I can repeat it again. I won't, but don't be discouraged and think you set out things and I don't know that I've had this part or that part or whatever, or I've not had enough of this. You see, that's setting the fire barrier up here. These things are only there to, uh, they're evidences that you can see in someone who is coming to Christ, but they're greater or lesser in every person. Some people, it's a powerful um, time, as it were, as it's slow and gradual, but at the end, there's change. There's change. Turning from sin is lifelong. A turning to Christ. May we all know that we are his, and he is ours. Amen. Amen. Amen.